Hey guys, Bugcat7 here. Okay, it is Thursday, March 19, 2020, and I'd like to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. All right, guys. Well, it's official. Um, I've been laid off. I work in the food service industry here in New York, and um, all restaurant business here is just in the dumpster. So nobody is. Uh, it's forbidden to have any uh, patrons in the dining rooms of any restaurant now. So either you do, you know, take out, you know, order, take order for order out, or you know, you have some sort of food service like, you know, Uber Eats or, uh, you know, any of those things. Or, you know, you're you're doing uh, takeout or, or you're doing delivery if you have that service. So I work in an upscale Thai restaurant and they don't do delivery. So their business was already cut down by the whole, you know, coronavirus thing and whatnot because they're aging people. So, you know, it becomes this thing. And, but now it's all restaurants everywhere and, you know, many people like me are going to find, you know, that they had to be laid off. And as far as finding, well, finding another job, everybody, you know, everybody has these restrictions. So it's, you know, you're not getting a job anywhere else. And finding another completely different field of work or whatever it is, well, that's all on hold right, in this environment where nobody knows what's going to happen yet. And I mean, it's just, there's just a tremendous panic and anxiety and it's like the black plague has broken out or whatever, but I think it's a bit too much and who knows what the reasons are or whatever, but the repercussions of this can be felt later on by everybody, but I'm the first casually here, so it's going to be a little bit um, hard times for me. I have a little bit of money, but, you know, not a lot, and it's going to be tough for me for a while. I'm going to struggle a little bit, but I'll try to keep bringing you videos as long as I can. Um, you know, most of the libraries are shut down, so, you know, if research in libraries out, I mean, I do a lot online, but, you know, again, you know, where am I going to hang out to do this? I don't live in one particular place. I sort of sleep around, but I'll keep trying to get, get you know, make videos and get this information to you. So. In any case, let's go on with my series looking into the accounts of the uh, quote unquote giants or large hominids, I like to call them, state by state. And next up is New Mexico. And New Mexico uh, accounts of giants and, you know, these odd, you know, hominid creatures in uh, New Mexico is because I've covered quite a bit of it on my channel. One of the videos on my channel, a pretty popular video, is the Towers of Silence, the Galena people in Galena Canyon, New Mexico. And this was out of C.W. Sram's book, The First American. And, uh, you know, it's a great book. And uh, Sram had written this in 71. He was actually the first author to write any sort of book on archaeology, covering archaeology, um, you know, for the layman, really, a history of archaeology. He was the first one to put it together. And, you know, so he had won all sorts of awards for that. He was a Nazi, an ex-Nazi. He was he worked for the Ministry of Propaganda, but that was because he was a very prominent writer and also in the newspaper business and, you know, was the a chief editor of a publishing house. All these things, you know, author, writer, journalist, all, you know, he's a very famous guy, too. He's well known among, uh, you know, writer circles and everything. So, I mean, you know, elsewhere in the world. So he's a very prominent guy. He was captured by a uh, U.S. in World War II, and he spent a couple of years in a prison of war camp. And then he came over here to America. So I guess he was offered the offered it or he wanted to. Who knows? So, you know, he didn't have a very high opinion of the Nazis. So it's evident in his work. He comments on it every once in a while. You can see he just he didn't care for them. But, you know, he's in the country. He's a well-known, prominent guy. That was his whole thing about this. And, you know, it's a terrible thing. But, you know, what's your alternative? A bullet in the head or what, you know, for you and your family or, you know, 
So, I mean, he liked America. He lived here for the remainder of his life. And he wrote this book in 1971 to tell us about more or less suppressed archaeology. He felt that there was a lot of suppressed archaeology here in the United States. And he wanted to tell those stories, you see. And one of them was about the people of Galena Canyon who seemed to be of a different phenotype. And I go over this in a more contemporary article where they beg the question, was there a genocide here? Okay. We're talking about an amazing archaeological site in the United States that nobody knows about. And this is for new subscribers. My old subscribers know all about this because I mention it again and again. Because it's such a phenomenal archaeological site and nobody knows about it. It's not a UNESCO site. They don't mention it. It's not a, a park or anything. So it's 500 stone cut block built towers, 25 and 30 foot towers, okay, on cliffs and outcroppings of bedrock in these desert canyons in New Mexico. You can see it in your mind if you know how phenomenal the landscape is there. And these things are perched up on 500 towers, Torreones, as the um, rancher who fa first found them, a Spanish fellow, and he called them Torreones, castles it looked like to him. The construction looked like castles, all right, with giant slabs of perfectly cut limestone block as bases with 25 to 30 foot um, towers of uh, either round or squarish shaped, okay, similar to you can find in Peru with these funerary towers down there, only in megalithic style down there, okay, so these squarish and round towers there, okay, 25 and 30 feet. The interiors were stuccoed and they had very brilliant um, geometric designs painted on the stucco on the inside of these houses. They had wooden platform roofs and wooden platform flooring on the inside with living space, <clears throat> etc. Kitchen with a um, a um, hearth there with a, a chimney to the exterior of the dwelling there and all sorts of fancy um, ergonomic type um, features to the furniture in there where you know the uh, can store grains etc ingenious sort of designs ready-made you know easy access designs so you find like in a modern kitchen if you, you know you want to you know see it in those terms and so these people, very, very sophisticated people, and they were seemed to be genocided. And they were of this different phenotype with the strange, you know, elongated shaped skull and uh, slightly larger, slightly more robust, as they say, or whatever. And um, the new, um, the contemporary article done in archaeological by uh, archaeology by um, the Washington State University archaeologists, I think, and <clears throat> where um, they found um, outside of one of these torreones, they found a pair of male and female skeletons and an infant, um, all you know, killed evidently, and their bodies were like bent over backwards and their necks snapped back. And they just found it curious, you know, the archaeologists find out very curious, but what's so interesting to me is that several of the accounts of the giants that I've already gone over in the, in the accounts I've gone over from state to state mentions um, these sorts of burials in the uh, burials we've heard about in all these states with the giants. So, you know, I heard about it through these accounts. Now we're hearing about it in a contemporary account of people like Galena Canyon. And I believe, and I'm not an anthropologist or an archaeologist, it's sort of a novice one, amateur one. I've done actual research out in the field or whatever. But it seems to me that this, the way that you know, the bodies were positioned was to indicate the vanquished enemy. And this is why, you know, this is to humiliate, the, you know, the corpses there. As vanquished enemy, and I think that they were probably the only bodies that were found outside any of these towers because the work done by Frank C. Hibben from the University of New Mexico 
um, found, and most of the people were found inside, you, you know, pierced by arrows, burned to death, because they, they apparently were attacked in the middle of the night, their houses burned, and another thing they don't want revealed is that the weaponry used to kill all these people apparently resembled the Pueblo peoples, or at least their ancestors, and, you know, the style of the weapons, so... This is one of the reasons why it's suppressed and they make no particular note of it. You know, mainstream knows, you know, just writes it off as nothing special. But Saran said that he didn't understand why that would be because the site is fascinating and Frank C. Hibbert did all this work, but nobody's ever heard about it. So, and, you know, it could conceivably be that these people are the progeny of the giants, okay, so the people at Lovelock Cave as well, and the people who may have been at the Salmon Ruins originally, and Hoven Weep originally, where they abandoned those sites, and that's why the Pueblos moved in, they weren't killed, you know, in the structures on those sites, so the Pueblos were willing to move in, right, but they killed them in the towers, there in Galena Canyon, in the 500 towns, the people were in them, so that's bad medicine, they weren't going to move in there, so that they begged that question, and so in the archaeology that was done either by Hibben or Mainstream or whatever, and it's clear as day, the reason why they weren't, they weren't going to occupy there, and they had no problem occupying Hovenweep or uh, Salmon Ruins or any of the cliff dwellings, which are also inhabited by these people people of a de different phenotype, as reported by various archaeologists, okay, so these people at, in these various places in the southwest could have been the progeny, like the Hohokam people, as a matter of fact, and I do a video on that, the survivors, the Hohokam people, because they also had odd shaped skulls and different sort of phenotype, and we mentioned Richard Weatherill, who's an amateur uh, he was a rancher who's out there who's discovered some of these naturally formed elongated skulls and then followed up by Harold S. Gladwin's work, who's a pretty important guy in the archaeology of Arizona. So this is all nearby these areas. And when you talk about giants in New Mexico, I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, these are the much older you know, evidence of much older cultures there, and what we see of the Hohokam, and the people at Galena Canyon, the people at Lovelock, because the Lovelock people, the Lovelock Cave people weren't just like a bunch of giants that supposedly, you know, that's what you were like made to believe, like, you know, there's just a bunch of giants living in Lovelock Cave, and they got rid of them one day by suffocating them all, and, you know, then killing them with bows and arrows as they ran out on fire, or whatever it was, but... If you look at the real archaeology and read the reports and the research done there, the Lovelock cave people were the Lovelock people who lived in the area there. They weren't just, you know, resigned to the cave there. They were a whole people who lived there. So the Paiutes took care of them, you know, on a false pretense that they were cannibals, where all the evidence we've researched so far shows that these people were probably most likely grain eaters or vegetarians and we're, we're going to see that it's going to be mentioned again in these accounts from New Mexico so this is why it's of special interest to me and if you haven't seen my videos on the Towers of Silence in Galena Canyon please do take a look at this. This some of the very interesting things that are said in here and uh, C.W. Saram in his book The First American brings this to us because he really believed that much of this archaeology in the in the United States was being suppressed and he didn't he really believed in the giants. So he really believed that they existed and but you had to be polite in those days. Nobody was really, you know, anybody who said anything would lose credibility in mainstream circles. And he didn't because he didn't come right out and said it. He just asked a lot of questions that we all would probably ask when hearing this information, but suppressed information, you see. So it's, if you haven't read it, I've, I went through so many chapters, I reviewed so many chapters of this in earlier videos on my channel. 
and it's a very interesting book and I highly recommend it to anybody who wants to learn about suppressed archaeology in the Americas and what uh, what Saram has to say about it on a variety of topics related to all the um, um, controversial subject matter of archaeology done in the Americas that we all know about so uh, please do watch these videos because Galena Canyon is just why this is a major major like unbelievably major archaeological site in in the United States and it's just completely ignored completely dismissed and for some reason it seemed to me that when the towers were found they were all intact okay because the uh, you know the rancher found them, the Hispanic fellow who found them um, gave the exact height of them and said how they were shaped and everything else and then Frank C. Hibben went there but it seems to me that the, most of the pictures you can see is a few little videos on YouTube about Galena Canyon they all seem like they were ruined and I have a feeling that they were used by as you know t for target practice by the military at some later date you know for artillery practice or something like that because it wasn't it's, you know these are the times where you know these things had to be for suppressed for political reasons internal reasons native american people's relations reasons whatever it might be so we just weren't getting a straight story and saram brings us those stories in his book the first American Galena Canyon is an integral in understanding this propaganda, you know, aimed at the giants as being cannibals, these boogeymen and weed children and all this kind of other stuff. It's just merely was a demonizing of the enemy to enable their people to kill all of these people off. And these people who were probably the progeny of the giants were all exterminated in these areas of the Southwest. Whereas in other parts of the United States, they seem to survive and integrate into the Native American populations as the Native American populations came in from wherever they came from. Okay, and they have been here all the time. Who knows? You know, we don't know the real history of the Americas. It goes a lot further back than we can possibly imagine. They're just discovering this all out now. They're going to have to revise even their view of the history, which is very conservative, in my opinion. It, they still have to review it based on all the archaeology that's current contemporary archaeology that's been done and revealed a different story altogether. So, let's get into these stories of the giants in New Mexico, because I think you're going to love them, and there's just so many interesting things, and we'll, we'll talk about it, but let's look at these, because they're fascinating, and again, this is, you know, probably the stories of the ancestors of the Hohokam, and the Galena people, and the Sami people, and the Lovelock people, and many of the peoples that, you know, were in those areas at some later date that might have been some hybrid people or you know the people who are suffering from this you know a more intense gravity their cells were bigger they were adjusting over the millennia and you know because the, the human body is capable of that sort of um, adaptation but you know it takes thousands of years right so they were adapting and getting smaller in size. They weren't 12 feet like this one, but they may have been eight feet or seven or eight feet tall. And that's certainly of unusual size today, being that average height is around five, eight, five, nine worldwide today. And seven foot and taller people are a fraction of a percent of the people in the world. All right, so let's read about this great stuff here because it's you'll be fascinated, I think. Old burial ground yields giants no less than 12 feet tall in New Mexico. Giant skeletons found. Archaeologists to send expedition to explore graveyards in New Mexico where bodies were unearthed. Special to the New York Times, Los Angeles, California. Owing to the discovery of the remains of a race of giants in Guadalupe, New Mexico, 
antiquarians and archaeologists are preparing an expedition to further explore that region. This determination is based on the excitement that exists among the people of a scope of of a scope of country near Mesa Rico, about 200 miles southeast of Las Vegas, where an old burial ground has been discovered that has yielded skeletons of enormous size. Luciana Quintana, on whose ranch the ancient burial plot is located, discovered two stones that bore curious inscriptions, and beneath these were found in, a shallow, excava in shallow excavations the bones of a frame that could not have been less than 12 feet in length. The men who opened the grave say that the forearm was four feet long, and that in a well-preserved jaw the lower teeth ranged from the size of a hickory nut to that of the largest walnut in size. The chest of the being is reported as having a circumference of seven feet. You see that right there? Seven feet circumference of the chest. Man! And I'm telling you, when, you know, again, and I, I said it, you know, in the radio interview that I did uh, yesterday with um, Jimmy on WOOL up in Vermont there in Bellows Falls on uh, 91.5 FM, Country Lunch with Al, we were discussing, you know, the very same thing. So, you know... These people are of such size, so how did large stone get moved around? Well, it's not hard to imagine the power of these beings and their capabilities, their strength. And it took a less than, they were, they were more capable than us in these areas, so, and their perception of their surroundings is certainly different at their height and everything else, so, I'm sure a lot of these large stones didn't need a lot of, um, you know, contraptions or sleds or ropes or anything. It's just a few of these rather large hominids could get together and move some of these large stones all by themselves. And, uh, you know, just, you know, imagining all these other things is unnecessary because these people were so powerful that it, this was no object for them. And even if they did use some sort of contraption, it took less men to do the work, and therefore, you know, most of their population would not be engaged. And, you know, similar to with these theoretical things that we would mention about large projects done by ancient peoples with sort of low populations, etc., and who would feed them, and do, you know, whatever it is, you know, imagine it in different terms now with people of larger, you know, larger size, larger stature, you see? So, I'm just, you know, throwing my thoughts out there on these things, and, you know, it gets complicated, guys, because, you know, you really have to use critical thinking with this stuff. Quintana, who has uncovered many other burial places, expresses the opinion that perhaps thousands of skeletons of a race of giants long extinct will be found. This supposition is based on the traditions handed down from the early Spanish invasion that have detailed knowledge of the existence of a race of giants that inhabited the plains of what now is eastern New Mexico. Indian legends and carvings also in the same section indicate the existence of such a race. So again, guys, I'm just, you know, in my mind from the research that I've done, again, with the Hohokam and the people at Galena Canyon that, you know, these giant races reported being there and then afterwards, at some later date, okay, that existed there were the progeny of the, the lot, you know, as you go further back in time, evidently, the skeletal remains of the giants and large hominids, or humanoids for that matter, not even Homo sapien, possibly, but related in some distant, you know, in a, a more complex story than we can even imagine, with horns and tails and everything else. So, you know, these the tribes that the Spanish were reporting seeing there in the, um, you know, in the, uh, 
15th century or you know 16th century were the progeny of these rather large hominids okay and then finally the Galena Canyon people and again with the integration in, with the Native Americans it could have been that some of these people were actually hybrids and I'm not the only one to think that Andrew Collins from Megalithomania just wrote a whole book about it so White Sands 22 inch footprints and M's mighty big footprints 22 inch and I uh, hate to be around that guy right there and he's just a mighty big feller Giant Shacks in the fall of 1932 Ellis Wright a government trapper reported that he had found human tracks of unbelievable size imprinted in the gypsum rock in the west side of White Sands. At his suggestion, a party was made up to investigate. Mr. Wright served as a guide. Old Fred Arthur, supervisor of the Lincoln National Forest, Edward Cadwaller and one of his sons from Mountain Park and the writer made up the party. As Mr. Wright had reported, there were 13 human tracks crossing a narrow swag pretty well out between the mountains and the sands. Each track was approximately 22 inches long and from 8 to 10 inches wide. It was con of the consensus of opinion that the tracks were made by a human being, for the print was perfect and even the instep plainly marked. However, there was not one in the group who cared to venture a guess as to when the tracks were made or how they became of their tremendous size. It is one of the unsolved mysteries of the Great White Sands. So, you know, this is in 1932 that they found these things. And, of course, you know, these are the type of things when these attention were brought to these things that mainstream archaeologists and people from the various institutions around the country you know made some you know rationalized them in some way to say that they were not this and it had to be made by some other animals and then eroded or whatever it is but no matter what it was it had to be explained that way it was never said you know okay well you know, 100 of these reports are, you know, 100% of these reports are all completely mistaken identity. Or, you know, the majority of the reports are mistaken identity, and some of them have to be actual accounts of human principles, because the law of average dictates that the, that possibility is the most likely you see, not 100% of them being completely um, mistaken identity. That's, it's, you know, now you're getting into the impossible range. So there even has to be a fraction of the reports that are actual because it's just too many times that these things would be identified as such and not immediately taken as something else and then identified. You see what I'm saying? So you have to take these things in the context of the understanding of what mainstream would allow us to believe because they craft the story they shape the narrative to fit and it's mentioned so many times and i forget what i was watching i think it was forensic files or something like that where somebody who was a reporter or whatever saying and, you know, I'm not morbidly fascinated with these forensic file things, but they keep you sharp in a way because it's, you know, I like Sherlock Holmes and Poirot and Agatha Christie for the same, very same reasons because it keeps you sharp. So, you know, they mentioned, um, they mentioned that, um, the, P, this, the police often get sort of tunnel vision and instead of sort of letting the evidence speak for itself they're trying to make it fit the suspect you know it's the person that they suspect of doing the crime or whatever it is so it's sort of like reverses where the evidence is revealing who the suspect is or what they're doing now is they're trying to fit the evidence to the suspect you see so it's sort of like a reverse thing or whatever and if one of the people said it's like a tunnel vision that police get so in a similar way 
mainstream archaeologists have this tunnel vision and we can't rely on their judgment because of this tunnel vision and that has to be considered when making your own examination because that's what that's what learning is see man learning belongs to mankind guys and that's what the trivium and the quadrivium that um you know um people talk about and their the greek systems of learning but i don't want to go into that right now but it's a type of, you know, rational progression of thinking and understanding from Greek times that you never heard about. And Jan, Jan Irving, my buddy Jan Irving, his channel is sort of dedicated to that sort of thinking. M Mesa Riga Giant, the Albuquerque Daily Citizen, Monday, January 27th, 1902. The giant skeleton, it will be removed to Las Vegas, New Mexico. Doc, Don Gregorio Varela and Marcelino Martinez have gone down to El, El, El Nervo. They will go on to the Mesa Rica and endeavor to buy the skeleton of the human giant, which was last week unearthed by Luciano Quintana. The giant would pay if brought here. The Smithsonian people, get this, the Smithsonian people would be proud of a giant of the dimensions of this one. Well, they might have been proud in 1902, but I doubt it. I think they were proud to have it so they could bury it immediately somewhere in a giant warehouse and never to be seen again and disappear in a fire or out the back door or in some barge in the middle of the Atlantic dumped. A leg is well preserved. It is eight feet in length. The skeleton will be on exhibition in the courthouse yard and anthropologists are especially invited to examine it. So you know, it just, the, the Smithsonian got involved, but, you know, another one of these extremely large show remains found, and this is 20, early 20th century. Um, you know, the Victorian times were ending, and the uh, Art Nouveau times were coming, and then into um, Art Deco after that in the, um, you know, the... Uh, Depression times in the 30s, 20s and 30s, Art Deco style came in, and then modern style, um, you know, sort of mechanical style, mid-century art. I know a lot about art, guys. I know a lot about a lot of things. My brain is all full of stuff. And this next article is sort of like a follow-up article to it, which is interesting because you, you don't often, it's rare to see any sort of follow-up articles or whatever it may, it may not contain any particular interest, but it's interesting that they show this follow-up article because it's sort of rare that they even show it, but Mesa Rica Giant confirmed, Giant Story confirmed, will bring the monster to Las Vegas for inspection and sale, so they're busy selling this off to any high bidder, and then God only knows what happened to it after that. And I'm sure they all ended up in the Smithsonian's hands or somebody related departments, Bureau of Ethnology, whatever, who cares. They all run by crooks at one time or another, whether it be Alice Herdlisher or Holmes there, and they all bad guys. La Voz del Pueblo of Las Vegas has received a letter from Luciano Quintana and the Mesa Rica confirming the story of the unearthing of, of a human skele giant skeleton on his premises and says he will bring it to Las Vegas for inspection and sale as soon as he has it wired together. He says the newspapers have not exaggerated the skeleton in any particular. So they haven't, they haven't exaggerated it, so it's sort of a follow-up article of this or whatever so you know a lot of the naysayers and the giant oh you know but look as I say you know thousands and thousands and thousands of accounts hours and hours and hours on this channel alone okay so you want to say 100% of them are off base mistaken identity 
you know, incompetence, whatever it may be. So many of these things were examined by doctors and professional people, university specialists, et cetera, et cetera, and all declared to be whatever they were. But, you know, they, again, their rationalization for damage, you know, those particular professors, whoever they might have been, they were mistaken and what, you know, just so everything is written off to follow the narrative. So, but, you know, this confirming it or whatever, again, these people were probably not mistaken. In fact, the the further back in time, you know, the people who have more intimately um, knowledgeable with human anatomy and skeletons and uh, bones of animals because they're laying all over the place back in those days and battlefields and everything else and coming across human skeletal remains was not something that was uncommon that further back in time ago. You see what I'm saying? So mistaking things, not knowing human anatomy, when things like this were laying around all over the place, I find that extremely hard to believe. Yes, today you would find a lot of incompetence work because that's not something people are intimately familiar with today, you see. But back in, you know, far further back in time, this stuff was just all over the place because of all the history of mankind that we know. Even a baloney history you could indicate bodies laying all over the place. I'm sure there were, you know. That's all part of the systems of domination that took control after the peaceful people were destroyed, like these giant peoples who evidently were very sophisticated, very intelligent, had far advanced uh, social structure, advanced art and craftsmanship, including etching, uh, engineering skills, astronomy, whatever it may be. And it's mentioned in these articles too. So let's take a look at this. This is a very interesting one as far as I'm concerned. Cliff dwellers, excavations in a ruined aboriginal city. Los Angeles archaeologist finds the skulls of a people who had 32 double teeth apiece. So that's very interesting. They have 32 double teeth and 32 teeth. And uh, now we're talking about a few extra molars beyond wisdom teeth. But where did our wisdom teeth come from? Well, you shouldn't our bodies being due to e evolution would have gotten rid of those things a long time ago. They only cause us problems, infections and all kinds of stuff. When our bodies have gotten rid of those things, well, maybe... This is a recessive thing or a dominant allele trait from, you know, recessive trait from peoples who we integrated with. Not only did the American Indian peoples integrate with these large hominids, but people all around the world integrated with the large hominids. And this is the mystery DNA that the DNA, DNA researchers and the genetic researchers don't want to tell us about because that's a whole different story and they're going to open up a can of worms and they're just not going to do it. They're not going to do it, folks. You probably, you and I probably have some level of giant DNA in us because it just, this is seemed to be the story all around the world, not only in the Americas. A communal dwelling of 2,000 rooms on a summit of a cliff a thousand feet high. And here we see the first high-rise apartment buildings in the uh, Americas here, but long before New York and, the, you know, the uh, Flatiron building was built in the 1900s, which I worked in, by the way. I was very interesting working in a Flatiron building some years ago, 30 years ago now for me. And uh, it was just interesting working in that building. It still had some, much of the original interior in there, plaster walls and wooden moldings, et cetera, et cetera. And I uh, worked around and all that stuff. It was all the lead paint, too. Uh, picture writing show that the sun and the turkey were sacred. Life in the, in the rock cave, so... The sun and the turkey were sacred. So let's read this very interesting article here. You'll love it. Laden with relics of the vanished race of the cliff dwellers, Reverend, Reverend Dr. George L. Cole has returned from a journey to the ruined cities of southeastern Colorado and New Mexico. Valuable results were secured by excavations in an ancient communal dwelling, as yet unnamed, which stands on the cliffs of the Santa Fe River, 14 miles from Espanola, New Mexico. This is the largest pueblo yet discovered in the United States, and Dr. Cole was practically the the first to visit it with scientific objects in view. 
He found stone implements and pottery of extreme rarity and the bones of a race, all of whose teeth were molars or grinders. Among the bones excavated from a burial mound on the mesa were a woman's femurs measuring 19 inches, a length which indicates that this aboriginal giantess must have been at least seven and a half feet tall. And just to go back to the teeth for a second, because we hear very interesting things among the giants here from the accounts that have previously gone over here on the channel, okay? Where people of this size showed wear on one side of their mouth and the front of their mouth on their teeth, yet their teeth were perfect and with, were without cavities, but they showed this extreme wear, either on the side teeth or in the front of their teeth. And now they're saying this again in this article here about these people found among the cliff dwellers over here, which might have been these large hominids, people of a different phenotype. And what I'm thinking about, and these people also were etching shells, maybe soft water clams, soft water shellfish, sea shellfish, which they could have got to them rather fast from the coast. They used the waterways and other ways to get all this stuff to people on the interior rather quickly and they were shellfish eaters so i'm wondering if they were actually their jaws were so powerful enough and they, if they were supplementing their vegetarian diet with shellfish and the bounty of the water the sea etc and not really meat eaters which seems to be a recurring theme or purely grain eaters in some cases the older skeletons maybe we'll wait you'll hear more about it but let's say, for example, they were so powerful that they were taking the shellfish and actually biting through the shell to get at, to crack the shell, instead of opening them by heating them, which would be the easiest way or whatever, but to eat them raw without having to shuck them, like you would have to do with a narrow-bladed knife. So I'm not saying that they didn't have narrow-bladed copper knives. In order to do that, there's evidence of copper and smelting and Galena Canyon and everything else, maybe even iron implements, but... Maybe they didn't need to do that. Maybe they could just do it with their teeth. I'm just saying, I'm trying to account for the wear on the teeth. I said there's some activity that they're engaged in where the teeth are being worn down. Like some activity, some productive activity that they're engaged in, some sort of processing or something or whatever that was a part of their culture there, put this wear on his teeth. It's a sort of excessive wear on their teeth or something in their diet that they ate that puts a excessive wear on their teeth, yet their teeth were perfect and often with no cavity. So you see what I'm saying about clean eating, and I mentioned that in the radio interview I did with Jimmy today, and or the last one, I'm not sure. But one of them, I'm starting to forget, too old. All right, so... Among the bones excavated from a burial mound on the mesa were a woman's femurs measuring 19 inches, a length which indicates that this aborig aboriginal giantess must have been at least seven and a half feet tall. During the journey just completed, which is the fifth, Dr. Cole has made a to, made to study the former habitations of the cliff dwellers. He and his son, Faye Seacole, visited the Mancos, the Chaco, and the other cliff dwellings, but they found the less visited ruins more interesting than the others. So, evidence of the seven and a half foot tall people being found there, no mention in any contemporary articles today of the cliff dwellers in the mesas there, like Mesa Verde, Snake Town, wherever. Okay, no mention of these large people with oddly shaped skulls in these areas in contemporary research, contemporary uh, textbooks, or anything. All right, so why would that be? Okay, why are they trying to keep this story from us? Because there's a whole different story that habitation in the Americas goes further back than we can possibly even imagine it. Well, I think that's more likely the actual story. All right. In the soft pumice stone, they burrowed dens for their families. Eventually, the original shelters in the cliffs grew to be a great warren, like a rabbit warren in the underground. It was, uh, you know. Room after room was hewn out until the rows were four or five deep. Under the shelter of the overhanging cliff, overhanging cliff walls were built, extending the rows of rooms. The cliff dwellers were sheltered from rain or storm, and their homes were inaccessible for, for their enemies. 
similar to the Galena Towers, there were no entrances, ground entrances. They had to be they had to be entered and exit with ladders that went up the side that you would withdraw the ladder when you went up top and then when you came out you have to put the ladder back down again down to the ground to get into the Galena Towers okay not satisfied with their rock caverns the cliff dwellers climbed upward and on the mesa 400 feet above the shelf on which the caves open, built a communal dwelling. This mesa is about three quarters of a mile wide and a mile and a half long, with cliffs all about and the best opportunities for defense. And again, the Galena Towers were built on these cliffs and outcroppings of rock in Galena Canyon. These Torreones, 25 and 30 foot, five ta foot towers with perfectly cut stone, and you never heard about it, stuccoed insides, you know, ergonomic furniture, you know, never heard about any of that stuff. So, and, you know, and I believe these were the progeny of some of these people who are talking about interim periods with seven and a half foot tall skeletons up to 12 footers, etc. You understand what's going on here, a devolution or a degradation of these giants. Their cells were giant size cells, bigger cells in a lower gravity and smaller shell had to develop into smaller cells in a more intense in gravity and I went over this in the gravitational biology video on my channel and that's you know mainstream research what happens to cells in low gravity and high gravity you know a low, a low gravity would enable larger cells therefore larger organisms to um, develop on this rock platform, a thousand feet up in the air, there stand today the ruins of two communal dwellings, one evidently much older than the other. The older dwelling is, is as yet untouched, and what little exploration of the more modern one, Dr. Cole had time for the amounts to a mere scratch of the surface. So you have evidence of older habitation and then evidence of newer habitation, as if inhabitants were there that then left abandoned the place new ones came in and did some of this work and how far back that stretches in time anybody could venture because they don't have any of the time periods dated correctly in my opinion there were not less than 1600 rooms 1600 rooms in the larger building in its prime says dr cole and probably 2000 the building measured 240 by 300 feet. It was a box of stone measuring 6 by 6 by 15 inches quarried from the cliffs below and carried up by the workmen. The rooms were roofed with timber and the walls then carried higher. In the center was a great court, a common kitchen for all, from which radiated immense numbers of rooms. Okay, so a common kitchen and we see evidence of this in the mound areas where these mounds like the ones the annular mounds I report about in New York State and in some a sister site in Canada where it's evidence of even in some of these large hominid cultures in the Northeast and up into Canada did some sort of communal um, processing of whatever it was in like you know common areas and this was a sort of, um, you know, common feature of these societies to have these sort of communal things such as cooking, processing of, you know, the material that they used. And this material processing was in great quantities and in great numbers, especially here in the Northeast. It's like in unbelievable numbers because the civilization in the Northeast dwarfs any of these reported in any other areas of the United States. Even Galena Canyon, seeing it's large, that's nothing compared to the Northeast. Northeast is gigantic. Biggest in the world, folks. The building spread with the growth of the community until it was three stories high and the room stretched away 12 deep from the central court with smaller courts here and there dr cole estimates that the population averaged about three to a room which would make between 4800 and 6000 people dwelling in the immense pueblo besides those who lived in the cliff caves so that's besides the people who lived in the cliff caves whoever they were 
The rooms at the sides of the communal dwelling averaged about four, 14 feet in size. On the upper stories, they were mostly smaller, some which being only 7 by 14, others 7 by 21. Some rooms were found as large as 14 by 21 feet, sort of suggesting a sort of hierarchy of, you know, people who were, you know, more important in society maybe got bigger rooms or, you know, for a particular purpose or, you know, something that we can't, we can only imagine you know, for other purposes um, to do with, you know, business of the people there, who knows, you know, it could be any one of those things. Today, the ancient Pueblo is a mass of ruins. The walls have been shaken down by storms or earthquakes, and the rooms are filled with debris. The Indian tribes that dwell in the vicinity have forgotten the history of the cliff dwellings, if indeed their fathers knew, and the cliff dwellers are a forgotten people. With the trophies of this summer's exploration spread about him, Dr. Cole has turned his parlor into an anthropological museum. One table is covered with the with the water jugs and incense pipes, the sofa hidden under the stone axes, mortars, pestles, weaving shuttles and pottery, other, another table is decked with a row of grinning skulls and huge crossbones. Beneath it comfortably repose all the parts of a skeleton from the toe bones to the shoulder blades waiting to be wired together and soon about are bows and arrows, baskets, jugs and twisted twigs made watertight by pitch. Modern Indian pottery photographs by the score and a hundred pound stump of petrified wood. The skulls are particularly uh, are a particularly valued possession. Look at those teeth, said Dr. Cole tenderly fondling the skull of the giantess, she has no incisors, the, no cutting teeth in front, as have all the other races which I have knowledge, any knowledge. She has grinders all around, and so have the other skulls. That shows they were grain eaters rather than meat eaters. The foreheads are high, and the shape of the skull shows intelligence, but notice how curiously they are flattened at the back. Okay, and this is why I always claim, claim they're brachycephalic, but that wouldn't account for these other features and, you know, what Weatherill claimed and Hannah Gladwin that some of these skulls were naturally formed and not result of artificial cranial deformation as we are being led to believe because there can't possibly be people with weirdly shaped skulls in the past because that would suggest a different story of the past. It is my belief that an earthquake tumbled down the communal dwelling, which I have just visited. The people were scared away and were afraid to go back for any of their possessions. That is why the pottery and implements are found untouched. Their religion must have been a sun worship. Their dead were buried with the knees drawn up to the body, face down, and head toward the setting sun. So sort of prostrated, bowing to the, the sun. In the picture writing and the pottery are continually, continual repeated representations of the sun surrounded by streaming rays. The turkey was apparently regarded as a sacred bird. Its bones are almost always found in the graves and its picture is frequently in the picture writings. In the cave dwellings were long turkey runs and turkey rooms where the birds were kept and fed. So see they identified some of these rooms as turkey rooms and guys this is evidence of the Native American peoples, even at later dates, keeping turkeys. They didn't have domesticated animals, but they did keep livestock. They did keep turkeys. So, and this is how, you know, people get so confused about these people and what the stone walls were for and everything. They didn't really need to keep the turkeys in these rooms or everything, but just, I'm, cer I'm certain that, you know, it was convenient for them, and I'm sure the turkeys didn't mind, because it's real easy to keep turkeys. You can ask Jim, the Paleo Mountain Man, Jimmy, my buddy up there in Vermont, how easy it is to keep wild turkeys. Well, it's just as easy as throwing a bunch of raisins onto the ground every single day. 
Okay, and you got your turkey. They're not going anywhere, folks. As long as you're throwing nice, juicy raisins on the ground, they're not going anywhere. Okay, they love that. Yum, yum. Okay, and they just hang around because you, they know you humans are going to give it to them. Just like any animal that you feed. Doesn't matter. That's how I mean, humans became intimately involved with dogs and cats and whatever other animals. By feeding them. See, because you're a nice guy when you feed them and, you know, they want nothing to happen to you. Until you beat them. Then, you know, they hate your guts forever and can never, never trust you ever again. The cliff dwellers cultivated fields in the valleys below their dwellings. They had to carry water to the top of the cliff. On the mesa, however, there were water channels and rock cisterns for rainwater, and this supplied them during a portion of the year. And they were brilliant at figuring some of these things out. We opened only two rooms and one burial mound. The results were so satisfactory that I am convinced any university or scientific institution which set to work to systematically open and explore the ruins would be richly repaid. So it's all about the bucks. I estimate that to complete the work would cost about $45,000, okay, back in when, 1902? or earlier, whatever, this is probably a whole lot more money now. The cliff dwellings, which are within easy reach of the relic hunters, have been despoiled and wantonly injured. Doors and lintels have been torn down, relics broken or scattered, and the process of destruction greatly hastened. Arizona has an antiquarian society, and Southern California its landmarks club, but New Mexico and Colorado have no organizations of sufficient strength to protect the relics of the cliff dwellers. So that's rather unfortunate that even at this time, these things were being wrecked for whatever reason, because people hated them, you know, 1899, this was. So it's a shame that that was going on, but again, you know, no regard were held for these things and whether they were, you know, looted and racked and by who knows who and, you know, all the towers at Green Canyon, you know, dynamited or, you know, blown up or, you know, target practice or whatever. It's a shame that that happened in this country and happened around the world in a lot of places and, you know, we were certainly, um, greatly hindered our understanding of these things. But they don't care about Galena Canyon because they want to keep that from you. Because that story suggests that the giants w were genocided there and you can't have that black mark on the record of the native peoples, whether it be the Paiutes or the Pueblos, whoever it was. They don't mind the cannibal story, although they poo-poo it, but you know, they're not saying anything, you know, it does, they don't go out of their way to say anything about it. They sort of like that propaganda story, I think. White Oaks Eagle, a titan-sized giant. The remains of an ancient race of giants are being dug from the earth at Mesa Rica near Las Vegas, New Mexico. Those residing in that vicinity are greatly excited. From exchanges in that vicinity, the following account is gained. The first of the skeletons of the monster men was unearthed by Luciano Quintana, who with five others listened to some old traditions and began to dig. As far back as the memory of the man goes, it has been common belief that certain rude stones on a mesa laid with surprising regularity mark the resting place of dead men. So that's very interesting right there. Is laid with surprising regularity among the resting places. It's interesting that they found these things. The oldest inhabitants tell of hearing from their predecessors, both white and red, that at one time the land was peopled with men who were giants in every sense of the word. Rude implements of enormous size have been found that could not have been used by anyone with strength short of an ox. But yet in the Northeast here, the same artifacts are claimed to be votive. Erroneous, erroneously 
labeled as voted because the skull remains found in the Northeast are just as large as anywhere else. But nobody's admitting it in mainstream folks. This is what's being kept, being kept from you. And the story is completely different than they say it is. And it's more involved and more complex and goes further back than you think. And they don't want to explain any of the stuff. They like their, their BS story that they hand us. So prevalent has been impression that this was the case, that Indian traditions are now retold of a race of human beings who ate at one meal a quarter of beef and drank five gallons of liquor. So, you know, their, uh, their uh, progenitors, their probably hybrids of these people because they were half human being, you know, homo sapiens started, you know, became meat eaters, etc., etc. Quintana listened to these wild tales for years and paid but little attention to them, but he never could satisfy himself that the rude stones had come in their place by chance, and for this reason determined to make an investigation. Selecting five others to assist him in the work, he picked out two of the largest stones and began to take up the earth between them. The work took several days on account of the obstacles which had been placed in the way, so obstacles had been placed in the way, at a depth of six feet, a layer of rock two feet thick had to be taken out. They had evidently been selected according to their shape before being placed in the ground, for each one fitted closely to the other. And Jimmy and I were talking about that on the radio show um, yesterday, the uh, radio conversation we had on WOOL, Bellows Falls, Vermont. Something similar we were talking about in the walls, the geometric shapes in the walls and how they fitted together into epigees, etc., and languages. After disposing of the rock, a, a layer of what had once been wood was taken out three feet in thickness. Another two feet of pure white sand was taken out of the hole, and the bones of a man were found. Though the grave was 15 feet long and 8 feet wide, the body had to all appearances been first placed in a hole in a sitting position and then doubled over until the face rested on the feet. Okay, so not bent over backwards, bent over forward, that's an honorable position. Bent over backwards is a dishonorable position. Some of the bones, and that's why their enemies would bend them over backwards, because bending over forward was an honorable position. Some of the bones, and this is what my research shows, guys. That's my anthropology on it, all right? So, you know, call me crazy, but I've been doing this for a while, and that's what I think. It's obvious. Some of the bones which have withstood the onslaught of decay show the owner to have been one of the largest men that ever lived. From those found, it is calculated that the giant must have been at least 17 feet high. 17 feet. A forearm fan measures nearly four feet, and it is in perfect portion, proportion in every other way. Only the lower jawbone is preserved, okay? So this is 1902, 20th century, early 20th century. And how interesting is that? Um, again, you know, the story we're giving here, folks, is just not, not that story. Right. Only the lower jaw is preserved and is three feet from one end to the other. Three feet. A tooth which was still sticking in it is large as a small bucket. Those who saw the bone say that his chest measurement must have been 120 inches. That's absolutely huge seven feet again. The ribs are enormous are large enough to withstand a fierce attack with weapons such as these people must have had. So, actually it would be um, 120 inches would be 10 feet in circumference. That's absolutely gigantic. There are numerous other tombstones five feet long in the vicinity that are supposed to be over skeletons of giants. So, don't forget they found these stones and the way the burial was done and everything. So, this is not, a, you know, not a dinosaur or anything like that. This is often what the claims are. But since this is maybe not an official um, dig done by archaeologists, they can dismiss it.
Plans are being laid to dig between all of them and learn whether or not there are more remains to be found. This may be another card of giants such as El Paso has on the hill back of the Mesa Gardens and until more is learned about it, 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 it those who take an interest will hold back their confidence in its being bona fide. So, you know, hey, a little skepticism there doesn't hurt or whatever, but, you know, this is the report of this titan-sized giant. Farmington's titan-sized skull. This is amazing. This is was real. It's just incredible. The Northern Pacific Farmer, 1981. Farmington's, I don't know, it says 1981, but I, don't, I think it's 1881, not 1981. Quarantine's Titan Sized Skull, a remarkable discovery, an extinct race with skulls three feet in length. The Durango record says the following extracts from a letter received by Mr. Charles Newman of the Wholesale Drug House of, the, of Newman, Ch Chestnut, and Stevens of this city will be found of great interest, detailing as they do the discovery of the most remarkable prehistoric remains ever yet unearthed that there were giants in those days can no longer be doubted. A skull measuring three feet in length testifying to their existence among the prehistoric people who once inhabited the valley of the San Juan River. Mr. Newman reports the writer of the letter, Mr. Carpenter, to be a reliable man and he will avail himself of this offer and take charge of the remains which will be removed to Durango at an early day. Farmington is situated about 50 miles south of Durango at the confluence of the Animas and San Juan rivers and the discovery was made within three miles of town. The following is the letter detailing the particulars of the discovery. And they don't have that letter, I guess, but Farmington, New Mexico, 1881. And uh, this, uh, a huge skull was indicating, you know, again, how did big skull get moved around with, with a lot less individuals doing the work than you might think? And didn't require a majority of their society to be engaged in doing work like that. You're free to do all the other tasks necessary, okay? See, it's not a big deal to them because they were gigantic. Moving large stone around or building things or whatever. Got done faster and, you know, less people involved. <coughs> the petrified giant <coughs> of Abo Pass. Discovered a petrified man discovered in New Mexico was a giant in stature 1904 Albuquerque Democrat the giant of Abel Pass or at least a portion of that historic personage is now in Albuquerque He is not in a museum nor is he in a coffin although he is very decidedly a dead one. Instead, that part of him which is in Albuquerque is suspended by a wire from the wall of the office of W.L. Trimby's 2nd Street livery stable, where yesterday a number of well-known ethnologists examined him and pronounced him the real thing. That portion of the giant, which has been transformed from the original resting place, is the head complete and the neck to the shoulders. <coughs> W.L. <coughs> Trimble and, <coughs> excuse me, F.F. F. Sturgis, the discoverers of the head, tell a remarkable story of its discovery and transfer from the past to Albuquerque. Several weeks ago, these gentlemen made an overland trip to Abel Pass to and the article's cut off as it often is and that's all we have because that's if somebody clipped it out of a newspaper or whatever and pasted it in a book they may have lost the other part of it or whatever you know you don't know might have been in another section of the newspaper so anyway guys that's it for the accounts here in New Mexico and again it was just fascinating some of these extremely large um, skeletal remains to be found here and at sites that are well known by mainstream where these rather large skeletal remains are found and not a mention of it not a peep crickets 
on these people, their phenotype or anything. All you ever hear about is the Native Americans that lived and occupied these dwellings and places at later dates when these people were nothing like those Native peoples at all. They were completely different. Their whole um, body type was different than these people. Who were they? Where did they go? But, you know, they sort of blend the histories together, sort of add confusion to the whole thing because they don't want to tell the legitimate story, guys. They just don't. All righty then. So it's rather long, but I wanted to go through these because the, all of these accounts, and that's, that's all of the accounts in New Mexico. I didn't even cherry pick. And they are just simply fascinating. And I hope you enjoyed those. Please hit the like button if you kindly would. I'm going to put links to my Galena Canyon video and the Hohokam video at the end of this video if I can. Um, it's hard to do these things now. I just changed the whole format on YouTube. But I'll try to do that. and Or at least put a link to them in the description where you can get them. So you'll be interested to know about it. Because that, that um, research took place in New Mexico as well, on Galena Canyon, and that is a must-know story for all new subscribers. I'm sorry I'm giving you some homework to do here, but if you're a new subscriber, you must see that Galena Canyon video in order to understand a lot of the research that I, and conclusions that I've come to on my channel. So please do hit the like button if you like the video, and I will be back with a video on something. I hope very soon we'll see. This current environment we're in of panic and anxiety and everything with the coronavirus is affecting a lot of people and now it's affecting me very personally and we'll see what will happen in the future guys, that's all. Alright, so anyway guys, Bloodcat7 signing out, peace.